Well, welcome everybody to the Inside MIT session number three. I'm Alan Tate, the Executive Chair of the MIT Sloan CIO Symposium. And today I am joined by David Verrill, who is the Executive Director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy, otherwise known as IDE. And so welcome, David. Great to be here with you, Alan. Excellent. So let me let me start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I think all of you know that today we're going to learn about IDE and how you can get involved. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to let you know that this session uh, will be about an hour. Uh, the first half, I'm going to talk with David. And then in the second half, we're going to open it up to audience questions. So you can be thinking along the way, questions that you want to ask David. To ask a question, go down to the reactions area under Zoom, click on that, and then click the raise hand icon. And then we'll recognize you in the order that you raise your hand. And I'll unmute people one by one. Uh, I would ask that you know, during the interview, everybody stay on mute just so that we don't have any background noise. So with that as housekeeping, uh, let me give a brief bio of David for everyone. So David Verrill, as I mentioned, is the executive director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. He's worked and consulted at MIT for over 30 years. Uh, David has also worked at the Xerox Adaptive products where he was manager of international sales and business development. Uh, and he's helped started two companies, including the Hub Investment Group, which has invested in more than 50 early stage companies in the New England region, including Zipcar and DraftKings. He sits on the board of several startups. He's the chairman emeritus of the Angel Capital Association and is the recipient of the Hans Severance Award. And so again, welcome, David. Thanks. Uh, that, that description makes me feel like I've been around for maybe too long. <laughs> That's been a while. <laughs> well, you you know you have been around for a long time and and doing a lot of uh, wonderful stuff. Um, and I should also mention that uh, you know IDE has long, long been a, a supporter and contributor to the symposium and so we're super super pleased to have you um but you know today's all about the ide so why don't we start out you know pretty simple you can tell us about the ide you know what is it you do and what kind of what kind of research do you do at ide sure yeah sure so the uh the ide sits within the sloan school of management but it draws from people across campus which is one of the benefits that a lot of the research initiatives at, at mit enjoy we're um focused on eight or so areas um uh, within the digital economy we've got um eight research leads that that focus on some of the pressing issues of our day and and our mission really is to kind of shape a brighter digital future for all of us i think with all of the technologies coming upon us so rapidly and, and doing nothing but accelerating, there's um, in some instances a fear of technology. We're a glass half full rose colored glasses, but we uh, we back that uh, optimism up with, with hardcore and applied research. Uh, the IDE has been around for eight years. Uh, I also ran its predecessor, the Center for Digital Business, which was a research group for at Sloan for 15 years. And we've always done applied research. We've always had an educational component uh, to, uh, to our group. Uh, we've always put on a number of events to, to communicate um, uh, our findings. We're basically um, uh, supported by uh, a dozen or two corporate members and other uh, very generous donors in the foundation world and in the private world. And um, it's it's a pretty easy um, gap for us to fill between industry and academia because we're talking about the digital economy. We're not talking about CRISPR technologies. We're not talking about brain science. We're talking about things that you and I are grappling with every day as consumers and that many of uh, the people on this call are are dealing with as uh, business professionals. So it makes it a lot easier to transfer and translate um, uh, typical academic research. And uh, that's what we do on a daily basis. We've, we've got a relatively small staff of 
of eight folks. Uh, we've got probably 10 postdocs, uh, 10 PhDs and or masters, RAs, uh, a dozen faculty. So we're, we're a very interesting uh, community that um, uh, has really come together a lot under our, our new leader, Professor Sinan Aral, who's a really dynamic uh, superstar faculty member at the Sloan School and, and really pleased to have him as, uh, as our leader. Yeah, and if I recall, you just have a quick slide to show all your research groups that maybe I do. And, and let me um, let me take that that opportunity to uh, let's see if I can grab mm -hmm. it here to talk in a little bit more depth um, about these these research groups. Um, and so people like Dave Rand, Dean Eccles, uh, Renee Goslin, obviously Sinan. Uh, John Horton and Andy are all Sloan uh, focused people. Neil Thompson has a joint appointment between Sloan and CSAIL, the computer science and AI lab at MIT, and Sandy Pentland is a mainstay at the media lab. So this notion of spreading across and outside of Sloan is, uh, you can see in, in this list. And these are the eight areas of research that we focus on. Uh, Dave Rand and Sinan Aral wrote some of the seminal pieces on misinformation, fake news, particularly with social media spreading um, false and misleading information online. And Dave's a very prolific researcher. Um, he's put out perhaps um, two dozen uh, academic papers in the last 18 months, which is just off the charts in terms of uh, productivity for a faculty member. Uh, Dean Eccles is in great demand right now because a lot of our corporate sponsors are A, trying to get access to data and analytics graduates, but also trying to understand what new mechanisms of analytics are that, that can be used. Dean also is the co-chair of the Conference on Digital Experimentation, which is one of our biggest events during the year, which uh, combines uh, both practitioners from industry as well as academics over the course of two days. Uh, so Dean's in, in tremendous demand. Um, Sinan uh, is really best known for his work in social media. He has a relatively new book called out, the, called The Hype Machine, which in many ways um, uh, pointed out some of the pitfalls in the future for unchecked social media. And uh, many of those things have, have come to pass, but his new effort is in Web3 and the metaverse. Uh, we have beefed up his research group. We have three new postdocs and three new PhD uh, candidates that are focusing on that research. And, and we're, we're staying away from the sort of the cryptocurrency end of the digital um, uh, asset space and focusing more on Web3, the metaverse, um, uh, diverse organizations. Uh, Renee Richardson Goslin is leading our human first AI group. Uh, Renee's amazing. Uh, she teaches the highest rated marketing course in the spring. Um, and she's uh, doing research that's looking at uh, how humans make decisions based upon whether or not information is provided to them through um, an AI based source of, of information or through humans and, and everything in between. And uh, one of the, the most popular pieces that she's come out with recently was featured in Harvard Business Review, talking about how uh, you, you might want to put friction in the human AI process to make sure that the data that, that people are receiving is A, from a trusted source, uh, and, e, and, and B, is fact-checked. Uh, Neil Thompson, as I mentioned, is uh, part in CSAIL and part in the Sloan School, also very prolific. He's looking at, digi uh, uh, at digital computing technologies, uh, looking at quantum computing, trying to understand where the first applications of quantum computing will be, what industries will be affected first, and therefore how those uh, particular sectors might prepare for quantum computing in the future. Uh, John Horton is a relatively new faculty member, uh, former chief economist at ODESK. Uh, NYU professor and uh, is working on AI marketplaces and in particular labor markets. Um, Odesk is one of the uh, labor platform, one of the, the first labor platforms and uh, John has had unbelievable access to, to their data and, and several others. And then perhaps the, the two heaviest hitters, if you will, Andy McAfee, which is uh, focused on tech for good 
Um, he has a, a book out called More From Less, which talks about um, uh, that technology without human intervention has actually reduced our uh, stress on a number of, um, uh, of materials in, in the world. Really interesting, different take on sustainability. And of course, Cindy Pentland uh, at the Media Lab is all about building a distributed economy. Uh, one of the most cited uh, social data scientists on, on the planet. So it's really an amazing roster of, of people. And there are several other um, folks behind the scenes from Duran Asamoglu in the Department of Economics um, uh, to others outside of the Institute. We have a, a digital fellowship program with faculty members from Harvard Business School, the Rotman School at Toronto, NYU, uh, Stanford, and, and others. So it's a really interesting set of people. And, and they all understand this notion of conveying and communicating their research to industry practitioners, public policy experts, and, and us uh, just as consumers uh, that are feeling the effects of, of technology. Really awesome group. Yeah, so while you have the slide up, I, I just want to highlight how some of these individuals have really contributed to the symposium. Uh, you know, Andy um, has given the closing keynote many years, I believe the last time in 2019. Uh, Sandy Petland gave the closing keynote back in 2021. Uh, Renee Goslin um, was a panelist in 2020, uh, just after COVID hit when we were doing the digital learning series. Uh, she gave a really nice uh, short presentation as part of uh, being on that panel that, you know, just touched upon some of the things that you had mentioned. And uh, I can give a shout out to Sanan's book, um, which was very informative for me. And uh, so, you know, this is a, a great cast of characters. And uh, also this year, our closing keynote will be with uh, David Otter. Um, who I believe is also associated with IDE. He is, yeah, David's awesome. He's done a lot of work in, in the labor space um, and recently finished up uh, running the task force on the work of the future, which was a presidential task force at MIT that uh, really did some awesome work. Yeah, so while we're talking about these people, uh, I'm just going to take you off track for a second. Can you tell us a, a little bit about the Digital Insider podcast, which I've listened to a few times and enjoyed? Yeah, we. Uh, this is one of the, the new activities that we started uh, just last year. Um, it's uh, called the Digital Insider podcast. You can get it through uh, wh wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, just in the first six months, it became uh, one of the top 20 podcasts in, in America. It's um, what you might imagine. It's Sinan Aral talking with uh, uh, people from industry, from uh, government, uh, from public policy, and looking under the hood, if you will, on uh, how technologies are being developed rapidly, how they're being deployed, how they could and should and and will be um, put forward. Um, we've had presentations, a podcast with Francis Haugen, who is the Facebook whistleblower, a really awesome interview. Uh, he interviewed um, Maria Reza, who won the Nobel Prize. Uh, she's a, just an amazing person who has uh, suffered from um, fake news and misinformation from uh, from her own government in the Philippines. Uh, Paul Darty, uh, the CTO extraordinaire at Accenture, uh, finished up last uh, last year. Ali Velshi, who many of you may know from uh, MSNBC and and his uh, his weekly television shows about uh, the impact of technology. Really, just an all star cast of characters, and we're just now developing our invites uh, for, for this year, but the first year was just spectacular. There, there are 30, 45 minute uh, sessions that are great for a quick drive or commute and um, very revealing and you know amazing people. All right. So um, just talk about IDE in general uh, again. Uh, can you tell us about your corporate memberships and sponsored research and how does that work? How do people engage with you? Um, just sort of paint the picture there. Yeah, it's 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 pretty simple. Uh, I think there are probably more than 100 um, research groups across MIT that 
that are not dissimilar from from the the IDE in terms of their structure. So most of us have a, a corporate membership program, and and we have um, a, a very important membership program at the IDE. And it's an interesting combination of um, digital native companies, uh, Netflix, Booking.com, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, and companies like that, and and others that are made of perhaps motivated a little bit differently. Um, consulting companies like Accenture, Capgemini, um, and then there are incumbents who are trying to grapple with how technology is rapidly chasing, changing what they do and, and trying to find the resources to help them develop their own digital uh, capabilities. So we, and we, we have a number of products and services that, that we make available uh, to those companies. Obviously, we produce uh, research and content every day, every week, every month of the year. We do it in the form of published papers. We do it in the form of research briefs, which are um, three and four page synopsis of, uh, of academic research that makes it a little bit easier to, to, to sort of zero in on the important components of what the research are pointing to. Obviously, our faculty write, write books, um, uh, white papers. We have a very active blog uh, activity, a monthly newsletter, which you're all welcome to, uh, to have access to. Um, and the Digital Insider Podcast. So all of that really is a series of products and services that are focused on transferring knowledge and helping provide guidance, insight, uh, forethought into how technology is and, and will continue to affect business, the society, and, and us as uh, consumers. We also um, play a bit of a role in the educational side of the house. Uh, we have probably eight exec ed programs that are being led by our faculty at Sloan Exec Ed, uh, both in-person short two, three days and, um, and virtual programs that are available anytime. And we also run each fall uh, a course called the Analytics Lab, and it's part of Sloan's action learning curriculum, which has become extremely popular in, in the graduate program. It's basically in many ways, the replacement of uh, when some of us were, were at Sloan and, and part of the requirement for getting the, the master's degree was to do a thesis. Uh, that went away 20 years ago, uh, but in its place, something even better has, has come about called action learning, where students work at a company, a nonprofit, or on a topic, whether it's sustainability or China or India, a not-for-profit, um, and and they typically spend a semester in, in these classes. And the one that we run is called the Analytics Lab. And the reason we run, we run it is because we're working with a large set of industry sponsors. And um, industry is at the core of the Analytics Lab because they're providing not only business problems, but very large data sets that the students uh, work on during the fall semester in teams of three or four and we have a pitch day to start uh, the semester off where each company comes and, and pitches their idea. Um, we've done a lot of pre-work in testing their data, make sure it's, a, it's clean data and a large data set. And the students choose uh, which projects they want to work on, and then they work with the company. And a number of people on this, this call are our mentors. I see Irving Vladowski berger He's always a great mentor to uh, at least one of the, uh, the A-Lab teams. And um, uh, it's it's fun. I mean, we 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 make it uh, real life, but fun. So uh, if I go, if I get rid of my background here real quick, um, let me see here. You can see this trophy here over my shoulder. It's a replica of the Stanley Cup, uh, which is given to the best team in the NHL, which this year is the Boston Bruins. Uh, and we give this cup out to the winning team of the analytics course. And uh, you can you might have seen a few dents and a little bit of stains on the top of it. We 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 gave it to, to the winning team last year for the weekend, and they they abused it well. They drank from the cup and they uh, threw it around. No telling what they did, but um, it's it's a great way for companies to get a a business problem solved. Some companies actually use it as a competition between an internal team and a Sloan uh, team. And uh, others use it as a recruiting troll. Uh, be, you know, it's, it's great to sort of target students that have worked on a project that uh, that's meaningful to your business and you've seen how they've worked, you've seen how they've 
They've developed insights, uh, their facility with modern analytics techniques, and uh, it's a lot of fun. It's free to participate in. Uh, we're starting to crank that up. Uh, next month, we put out an RFP. I see uh, Ellen Hersfelder uh, here on the call. Her, her company, Better Vet, participated in, uh, in the last semester's uh, project scope and uh, hopefully gained some really important insights uh, for, for the business. So we have a component of on the educational side. And then lastly, we put on a number of events during the year and, and many of them are free uh, to participate in. And actually what I think I will do is put up the, uh, the roster in a quick uh, share screen here. Um, let's see if you can see it here. Um, we uh, recently held the Thinkers 50 and IDE conference uh, in February. Uh, it was captured in video, so you're more than welcome to, uh, uh, to, to, to take a view at it. it. It talked about the splinter net, it talked about remote work and, and managing teams. Um, and it talked about uh, the strength of weak ties, which was a, a, a very popular 30-year notion in, in management science, which until Sanan Aral and other colleagues um, used data to prove it was, was but a theory. Um, that's a free event. The Social Media Summit coming up in April is a free event. Uh, and then the Platform Strategy Summit, which is now a decade-long uh, annual event, is um, not free, but open. Uh, for participation, and if anybody would like to uh, participate in any of those events, just uh, just uh, reach out and uh, and give me a shout. So, uh, a lot of research, um, a lot of events, uh, exec ed, um, education in, in the A Lab. It's a it's a robust set of activities that we encourage people to participate in. Yeah. So, David, this is all uh, fantastic. I wonder if you could just take a moment to talk about how IDE has been transforming. In particular, I think you mentioned that you have an updated mission uh, statement. Um, you've added some new research groups. Of course, Sanan is, is new. So just in the present right now, how are you guys transforming? Yeah, we, we've, uh, Sanan has, has, had a, uh, has put his fingerprints on the IDE since becoming the faculty director three years ago now. Um, he took over from Eric Brynjolfsson, who escaped to, uh, to Stanford. Uh, Sinan was Eric's PhD student, so uh, I ended, actually worked with him way back when, when he was uh, a PhD student and then a postdoc, so I've known him for 25 plus years. He's unbelievably dynamic. He, uh, he has um, things going on in, uh, in the for-profit world. He's a leading professor at the Sloan School, he's one of the youngest tenured professors here, and and his focus uh, when he became the the director was to say, okay, look, we want more faculty involvement uh, in the IDE so that we can grow it, and we're going to do that by identifying the next set of superstars uh, and, and encourage them to participate, help them connect with industry, uh, make it easy for them to do so, and that's precisely what we've done. So. People like Dave Rand and Dean Eccles and uh, Renee Goslin, John Horton, Neil Thompson, they are the next set of superstars um, at the Sloan School and, and beyond. And um, they're prolific. They're very good people. They understand how industry works. They speak the same language. And so it makes it, it, makes it for a very easy task for me to, uh, to facilitate their connection with our, with our supporters. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, we've got a, a renewed mission statement. It's short, it's pithy. We're shaping a brighter digital future. That's what we do. We're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna change the future. We're going to shape it. Uh, we're, we're, we're not leaders in government where we can put regulation together, um, uh, but we're thought leaders and uh, we're trying to do it in a bipartisan, as much of a bipartisan approach as we possibly can. And uh, I think it's made for a very powerful set of, uh, of tools and capabilities for, for the new IDE. All right, shaping a brighter digital future. Um, you mentioned that a, a lot of what you do is very similar to a lot of other labs across MIT, but if you had to pull something out, the, the thing that really makes IDE unique, what would it be? Well, I mean, I, I think we, we get it. Um, and, you know, uh, academia um, is 
by definition, always looking forward, um, uh, maybe looking beyond the horizon a little bit. And um, I think a lot of the people that support the IDE, whether they're a foundation, uh, an individual, an alum, or a, a, a corporation, um, need to assimilate that information and translate it. And, and we make it pretty simple. Um, I mentioned all of the outputs that we provide. All of them are really geared towards taking what might be perceived as a deep into the uh, into the trenches academic um, uh, research activity and making it relevant. And one of the things that makes it a bit easier for us is that there isn't a big divide between um, us in the digital economy. We're all grappling with technology. Um, some of us are at a point where we're relying upon our 25 year olds to provide tech support to us at, at the home. But, uh, you know, we're, we're all living uh, in, in, in a, a time of really rapid technological change. And it's good to feel like you've got a handle on it rather than just fear it or ignore it. And, um, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. Excellent. All right. So before we get the audience questions, I think you had one more slide just to highlight how people can get in touch with you. Do uh, you got a chance to show that? Yeah, let me see if I can bring that back up. So if you need to get a hold of me, um, you can email me or uh, give me a call. I haven't gotten a phone on my landline in about uh, 36 months. Um, so that's why I put that number up there. Um, but feel free to reach out to me for, for anything you wish. Uh, I'm always uh, available and, and interested in talking with you about the digital economy and figuring out uh, how we can get people more connected with us. Okay. So with that, we are more or less at the halfway mark, and that means we're going to open it up to audience questions. Um, so I'll just be, remind people that down in the reactions button, uh, you can raise your hand, and this is a great opportunity to connect with Dave directly and um, ask your questions. So anybody want to jump in? Irving, Irving, I, 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 you, you just made me ten dollars. Uh, I bet Alan ten dollars that you would be the first one to ask a question. Oh, really? Well, that's great. I'm glad I'll, that uh, I made you some money. I'll split it with you. So, <laughs> so David, as you said, uh, I've been involved with IDE and its predecessor organization, Center for Digital Business, uh, for a long time. And let me ask you, so as I remember, one of the things about the Center for Digital Business, when did that start? Was it in the 90s already? That uh, far yeah. back? It started in late 1999, uh, 2000. That's and what I thought. Yeah, it, that's what I thought. It was 15, a real, 15 year run. It was an awesome run. Yeah, it was a real precursor to try to figure out what's going to be the impact of the internet, and digital technologies on business, very practical on impact on the real world. Right. Now, here we are sitting on top of what looks like a major revolution in AI with foundational models and large language models and uh, chat GPT. And there's a lot of interesting stuff. Is it sentient? Is it intelligent? Whatever. But getting back to the Center for Digital Business, what will be the practical impact of these incredibly new capabilities to the world of business? And has that been going on in the IDE already? Are people thinking about that? Yeah, I mean, I, and thank you for, for reminding me of, of the history, because I think it's an important inflection point when the CDB became the IDE. And, and, uh, and really the trigger point for that was a book that Eric Brynjolfsson and, and Andy McAfee wrote called The Second Machine Age. Right. And it was kind of a, a call to arms. Uh, we need to pay attention. Um, there are some things we need to prepare for and do for this rapidly ascending set of technologies. 
and and AI was we were just really scraping the surface of, of AI at that point. Um, and you know, it was interesting. I, I was talking with with Sinan Aral and, and Eric Brunelson a couple of months ago, and they were sort of reminiscing about um, uh, Sinan's work on social media. And he went to Eric uh, when he was a postdoc and said, you know, look, I think this social media thing is has got some legs to it. I really want to focus my research in that area. And Eric was like, well, yeah, I it, it sounds interesting. I don't really know much about it, but but go after it. And I think we're at a similar point right now when uh, when you look at uh, the impact that social media has had upon us, both good and bad, and this this. Uh, basically 15 years of research that Sinan did on social media. Um, and his book, The Hype Machine, I think did a great job of calling out the, the errors and the potential issues that, that could be coming down the pipe. And they're, they're not just um, regulatory, they're human nature and they're business oriented. And I think the same thing is happening with AI right now. Um, uh, so, you know, chat GPT and these large learning models, language learning models, are amazing and um, scary. Um, and we've been doing research in this space for three, four, five years, but it nonetheless, it's still amazing how quickly chat GPT has come onto the scene. I was watching mm -hmm. Jeopardy last night and there was a chat GPT question on Jeopardy. And mm -hmm. if you had put that, that question up just four months ago, five months ago, nobody would have would have gotten the answer on 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 jeopardy so things are moving so so very fast and i like to think that our faculty are slightly ahead of that curve as as crazy as that sounds and and they're they're slightly ahead of that curve a because their research gets them there and b because the students at mit are pushing them um, you know, the, the students at MIT are pretty amazing people, and uh, they're using and taking advantage of this stuff a lot. And, um, you know, you, you have some concerns, particularly in education, about chat GPT be, being used nefariously. You know, students not doing the work, they're just getting, you know, this, this, uh, um, this system to, to write it for them. And, and Renee Goslin made a very interesting comment yesterday when we were talking with, with one of our our sponsors supporting her work, Accenture, she said, you know, I'm going to encourage the students in my class to explore chat GPT, mm -hmm. and I'm going to help them understand the differentiation between human generated and AI generated information and knowledge and the importance of human in, in the loop. And so I really feel like we're, we're kind of uh, at, at the bleeding edge, if you will, and we're not just um, prognosticating, you know, we're doing hardcore research um, uh, on on these topics. And I think it's it's, it's prescient. And and MIT is renowned for doing this in, in many, many disciplines. And we're the ones doing it in the digital economy. And David, let me ask a follow-up question on that. Given that you've you play you've played a central role in the whole entrepreneurship, especially in the Boston area, are you seeing uh, startups uh, trying to figure out what to do with this, how to monetize these new foundational models and stuff like that. What's going on in that world? Yeah, I mean, you see some pretty wacky stuff in, in the startup space. I looked at yesterday, two MIT alums and a Harvard alum are putting together a, um, a metaverse jet company. Uh, for for travel, I mean, I'm I'm not quite sure if I understand the revenue model from that. But if you if you look at kind of the themes over the last three or four or five years in the entrepreneurship space, uh, you know, the SaaS oriented business models is something that you've got to put into your your your, your new business plan. Uh, you've got to put AI in there at some point, uh, and and we've we've spent a lot of time looking at startups and in the last couple of years to try to determine are they really using AI and what AI are they are they really using? And now people are using chat GPT like it's just a, a you know a support mechanism for content creation. We're we're using it uh, for our events to help us write our event reports. Um, will we replace the editorial people that we contract with? No, I mean they're amazing. They they get it, they 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 have context. 
um, and they have nuance. But uh, gosh, you know, writing a first draft of of uh, uh, of an eight hour long event uh, might be easier to start with GPT chat and, or chat GPT, but, but rather than uh, your typical editor. So taking a little bit of the drudgery out of uh, the process is maybe maybe the primary thing. But um, yeah, I, 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 I think that um, uh, startups kind of push the envelope a little a little bit. And at the end of the day, it comes down to people. Um, if, if you look at, um, you know, I, I've been involved in 50, 60 startups over the last 20 years. And if you look at the failures, it's 95% human error. <laughs> so I'm not sure that that uh, that AI will change that in the future, but- uh, No, uh, I, I suspect that we'll see the equivalent, something like the chat GPT or large language model bubble over the next five years. And at some point the bubble will burst and a few major great things will come to the surface. Yeah, we're 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 on the steep slope of the hype curve uh, in uh, in this technology space. Yeah, you know, David, I was on a call uh, the last week with some small business owners, and these weren't necessarily people who were particularly in the high tech world. And even so, many of them were already adopting Chat GPT to you know, write some documentation or get, at least get started and, you know, keep costs down. So I was really surprised how quickly um, people are just picking up on it uh, if they're trying to run a small business in the digital space. Yeah, um, there, there's definitely some low hanging fruit there to be had. And um, I think people should take advantage of it. That's it's, it's free and it's good. And uh, it's a real time saver for, for a lot of people in small and medium sized businesses. Yeah, for sure. All right. Uh, who else has uh, a question? Uh, be Don't be shy. Raise your hand and we'll get you in. I I've never another, seen. I got another 10 bucks on Dave Weber. <laughs> Dave, you're, com you're coming through. Oh, I see uh, Anton is there with his son. Anton? Oh, with my son and the son, sorry. And <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, I guess the uh, just to catch up, because I, I ended up missing the very beginning, so I apologize. But, uh, but um, the uh, aside from the chat GPT and AI, uh, do you see within your center any other area that somebody or some PhD student or somebody like that say, hey, this looks very interesting. I really want to dig, dig you know, deep into it that you see might be an interesting future direction. Just, uh, yeah, for, where you... yeah, for sure. I mean, if you, if you look at some of the bigger themes out there in corporate America, then certainly sustainability is is one of them um andy mcafee is is taking a very interesting and researched approach to uh understanding how we're putting less stress on on the environment he's running our tech for good research group um if you think about computing technologies we're mit um uh, the future of computing with moore's law in decline and the hope if you if uh, hope or hype of quantum computing, um, we uh, we have a quantum prize in one of the courses that that uh, Jonathan Rowan teaches. He's a researcher with us. Uh, Neil Thompson's done some interesting analysis of um, uh, of, of uh, implementations of quantum computing by industry sector. Uh, John Horton's focused on labor markets and matching people up. Uh, and, and looking at remote work and, and management. So I think that those uh, those are really primary themes of, of the IDE and they're kind of primary themes for every company in, in the world at this point. They all care about those key themes and, and uh, we've got some particular expertise to put at it. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna ask, is Moore's law actually in decline because quantum computing is right around the corner? By well, the way, this was a test to see if you could tell the difference between who's my son and who am I. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a it's a it's a it's a slightly different uh, 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 technology, but uh, yeah, I mean, I I think that um, 
the the impact on the environment of computing also is is kind of an important thing for all of us to to consider and and Neil's got a really recent piece um uh, two pieces out actually uh, on that topic as well so they're um they're hot topics and and they're very interesting interesting all right thanks So, Alan, uh, uh, may I ask another question? Of course you can. So, David, uh, this is an important question for me because at the upcoming CIO Symposium, I'll be leading a panel on Web3. Hmm. And of course, the first question is, what in the world do we mean by Web3? And what we know is not the internet of the 1990s, first generation, and it's not the social media internet of the 2000s. So it's whatever will come in the next five to 10 years or so. So if you were going to give me advice on what to focus on in the Web3 panel that IDE is actually quite involved in, what would you tell me to do? Well, I don't have a perfect answer for you, and let me tell you the rationale for 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 uh, for for this um, discussion. So, when when uh, when we were talking with Sinan about beefing up uh, our Web three research, um, I pushed him and said, you know, what are we going to be doing? Um, what's going to be the focus? And he said, well, we're going to do this uh, in a tried and true fashion. We are going to collect data. So that when real issues uh, about the metaverse come up, we can rely upon that data to perform some analysis to come up with a uh, with a fact based response. So um, I'm not going to tell you that we have a paper coming out in three months that you know explains the metaverse and tells people what they should be doing or should not be doing with it. Um, we're gearing up for mm -hmm. being. A, um, a fact based data based um, mm -hmm. provider of uh, thoughtfulness uh, and direction for the metaverse. So, at the same, having said that, we're staying away from uh, some of the obvious issues in 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 that world. I mean, certainly, uh, digital assets are an important component of the metaverse, uh, but we're staying away from the cryptocurrency. Uh, space. There are other people at MIT that are, you know, in the deep end of, of the pool with that. There's the cryptocurrency initiative at the Media Lab, and there's also mm -hmm. um, a, a, an initiative, a small initiative at, at the Sloan School. So um, while digital assets are going to be a critical part of, of Web3 and the metaverse, uh, we're just completely staying away from the cryptocurrency marketplace. And, and uh, that's been from the beginning, we just kind of sort of felt like that was uh, too risky a place for us to uh, to be working, and frankly, couldn't find any interesting academic questions to to put against it. Um, so we're taking a data oriented approach. Mm -hmm. We have three PhDs that are collecting oodles and oodles and oodles of of data from uh, from marketplaces, um, from DAOs, and and, mm -hmm. and any other provisioner that you can possibly imagine. And um, as the key questions arise, we hope to be able to uh, to respond to them. But I think we're so nascent in the space that we don't even yet know what questions to ask. Yeah, that's great. It's also important to remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, the last major advance in digital user interfaces may well have been the GUI, which was developed in the 1980s. So it's not unreasonable to say, gee, where is the next world of user interfaces, 3D, immersive, whatever, for enterprise applications? And we don't know, but I think we've decided whatever the hell it is, we're going to call it metaverse to take us to the next level. Is that a reasonable way to think about it? Yeah, I mean, I, let me sort of translate that into, um, you know, maybe the way that, that uh, in hindsight, a lot of our faculty would respond. And, and I'm thinking about uh, the, the second machine age 
book as as sort of the the key point here. And and Eric and Andy in in that book sort of pointed out that it takes maybe two or three generations of yes. management for a new technology for a general purpose technology to really take shape. I think that that cycle is actually increasing a little bit, um, but. Uh, I, I, I still believe that that concept is true, that mm -hmm. uh, we just as people, as managers, um, get stuck in our ways and it takes us a while to, to assimilate a new technology and to get our arms around it and to develop a way in which it can help our organizations. And then we're going to go through the educational and business process part of uh, making changes. And, and those, these things take a generation or two of management. And I don't think it's any different for chat GPT uh, no, no. Or, or any of the, or, or the metaverse or any other um, technologies. It's gonna take us, you know, 10, 20 years to kind of yes. figure out really how to best utilize and get the most value out of these things. And along the way, we're gonna try to guard ourselves against uh, the obvious pitfalls that, um, mm -hmm. uh, that, that come about. So it's not an easy task, but I, I um, I'm I'm pretty convinced that that these things take time, but I'm also pretty convinced that the 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 pace with which these major changes are are uh, are, are taking is is getting much shorter. Hey Dave, uh, so when I think back to the second machine age, one of the things that was striking about that book is how they outlined how so many people had underestimated. Uh, how rapidly some of these technologies were going to come along and just how big the impacts were going to be. So if you were going to, someone at IDE was going to write the next version of the second machine age, you know, where do you think they underestimate this time? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I think that AI has been around long enough so that we probably shouldn't put it into that category, but I really think it, 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 it will be, a major impact on everything that that we do. I'm not talking about general artic artificial no, intelligence. No. I I still think that you know we're decades away from anything close to that. But gosh, you know, we when when we've got a simple tool that's free and and available to everybody to use that is is pretty darn good. Um, you have to take notice, and and um, you know, I I, I had to laugh when. There's a, a local politician in Massachusetts who who used Chat GPT to write. Uh, the new rules and regulations um, in about uh, freedom of speech and communications and other things at the at the state level, and I thought it was pretty interesting that that uh, he was prescient to to use a um, a threat to, uh, uh, to 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 open communication as the mechanism to to help craft the uh, the regulation. So I mean, we're we're using these things pretty rapidly, and uh, AI's got to be in in that space. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that we also uh, need to take into account kind of the human nature component of it. And I think that's, that's I think, a redeeming quality of, of the research at the IDE. So uh, John Horton's work on labor markets, uh, you know, there we can look at, um, you know, the impact of Uber and Lyft um, on the, and the gig economy in our marketplace as a, as a good precursor to enabling us to move into a virtual work world um, uh, at, at will has is, is been a pretty interesting development. But there's this human component that's important. Same with Renee Goslin's work in um, uh, human, uh, human first AI. Um, you just can't avoid the human component. And I think that's an important uh, capability of the faculty that we've assembled in, in our research group. Excellent. Um, other questions? I will, jump, I will jump in with a question here, Alan, if that's okay. Oh, that's great. Uh, David, you, you talked a little bit earlier about the uh, evolution, if you will, and then the transformation from the Center for Digital Business to the IDE, and I would say a broadening of some of the research topics, uh, as you've talked about into social media and some of the newer technologies. Could you say a little bit more about what it means for the IDE to be housed at Sloan at a business school in comparison to some of your peers or if you will, competitors out there in the academic world where activities 
in, that are looking into similar topics sometimes sit within law schools on the policy side or are heavily grounded in a comp sci department. I think of the partnership in AI as an example, something that ID belongs to, Media Lab belongs to. Um, I didn't see any other academic uh, uh, partners in that group coming in uh, from a, a home in a business school. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious what that's meant over the uh, more than 20 years now of your combined history of Center for Digital Business and now the IDE. Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, gosh, if, if, we, if we look at the, the Sloan brand, it's always been technology focused. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when I was uh, at the Sloan School in the, in the late 80s, um, probably 60, 70 percent of our class were came from engineering undergraduate backgrounds. Um, and so there's always been this notion of, you know, technology and management that, that has been the hallmark of the Sloan brand. And fortuitously, that's really uh, led to organizations like the IDE, the CDB, management of the 1990s, the IFSRC, and other research groups at the Sloan School, which have always embraced this notion of, of a technology, underlying technology driver. Um, and I, I think that's really part of the fabric of the Sloan School and, and uh, to a larger extent, uh, MIT. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Men's at Manus, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, component of, uh, of mind and hand has always been important uh, for, for the Institute. And, and Sloan has always embraced that, uh, even as a, quote, professional school. And it's it's sort of just played right into the um, the playbook that that we've developed with the CDB and and the IDE. Um, obviously, we work with other groups across campus because they're doing highly relevant uh, in in some instances very similar work. Um, the Schwartzman Center has a um, a computing initiative that Georgia Paracas of Sloan is one of the two co-directors. Um, it's it's a uh, uh, the proper use of computing. CSAIL has uh, a lot of research on AI, human human oriented AI. Uh, uh, the media lab and economics departments are are playing similar roles in that. So you know we it's not like uh, it's just Sloan, but we we really have that that heritage uh, and that that DNA, if you will, where uh, we have this unique combination of management and technology and, and we're in the right place at the right time at the moment. And I don't think that's gonna go away. Yeah, so uh, Anton, I thought you just left your hand up, but apparently you've got a new question. Oh, I keep waving and just a quick follow-up. I'm actually angling for another 10 bucks. I'm hoping that maybe, you know, David <laughs> might spring or share the- Well, this, maybe this question's from Alex. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'll come. I'll come hunting for it. But since uh, I'm just thinking on the AI and the chat BT side, since it's already taken up even a piece within this discussion alone, right? Uh, and uh, it's it's clearly the first mover in the marketplace. It's been shown to have some pretty strong biases. Uh, Microsoft seems to be including a you know chat engine within their browser. A couple of other people are working on them, and I'm just wondering: is anybody there looking? do any kind of comparison or do you think that the first mover advantage will basically just propel chat GBT to become the new Google, the new whatever the-, the Well, next? yeah, for, for, for sure, uh, chat GPT and Microsoft now are a, a real, if not existential threat to uh, to Google and their, and their search business. But I'm, I'm pretty certain that, uh, um, the, that there'll be some pretty fast followers in, in this space. It's not like, uh, uh, chat GPT took 35 years to be developed uh, you know it was it was less than five so um while while the lead may be slim it's it's going to be difficult to uh to have a sustainable um you know advantage in in the long run but um yeah we'll we'll see and and from a from a research perspective uh no I don't think we're 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 we're, we're probably too academic uh to to look at the differences between, um, you know, so the competitors in in uh, in that particular space, um, but along the way, we'll figure out some really interesting academic um, uh, questions to, to solve. Curious, maybe maybe launch some PhD student on it or whatever. But uh, anyway, for sure, for yes. sure. <clears throat> uh, David, one thing that I learned 
in some of the seminars I've been attending at IDE, like remember the one from, I forget the name of the people from Accenture. So whereas we have things like ChatGPT, foundational models at one end, if you look at the wider business market, the uptake of AI continues to be very slow, correct? Yeah, it, it, it does indeed. Um, and, and in fact, uh, in the, the Thinkerfest uh, event that we had a couple of weeks ago, uh, Accenture put some really interesting, interesting statistics about the uptake of AI uh, across uh, sectors that's very low. Um, and in interviews of CEOs and, and at the board level, there's still a, you know, a lack of knowledge and understanding of AI and how it may impact uh, the business. And, uh, and that sort of, sort of reverts back to this notion that it takes a generational change in management for a lot of these technologies to, to be fully utilized. And, and that statistic sort of <laughs> brings it, the point it, it, home. It's as true now as it was with steam engines. That's really yeah. what it comes down to. Yeah. Exactly. 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 Yes, of course, the uptick may be a nonlinear function, uh, but we'll see. So we have time for one more question. Who wants to have it? Anyone? How about you, Alan? You asked the last question. I asked the last question. <laughs> No, we'll uh, see you the 10 bucks. You can keep them. <laughs> <laughs> so, David, I guess, uh, you know, I don't really have a question to ask except to thank you and uh, IDE for your long support of the symposium. It's very much appreciated, and we love having your speakers. Well, Alan, I, I appreciate your uh, your leadership of the CAO Symposium, uh, and particularly making it consistently relevant in a, a, a tough couple of years of, of COVID. And uh, appreciate uh, uh, the forum to talk about the IDE. We're, we're glad to be a partner of the CIO Symposium. And um, uh, hopefully we can continue to, to seed the agenda with, uh, with our researchers and our faculty. I appreciate the, uh, the time. Excellent. Well, we look forward to it. So a quick couple words to our audience. Please join us on Tuesday, April 4th at 12 o'clock for a discussion with George Westerman, who is a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management. And they're going to be talking about, he will be talking about uh, the 20-year CIO Symposium retrospective. And this will be the final session of the Inside MIT series. And after that, you can join us for the new CIO to CIO series, which will kick off on Tuesday, April 18th. Shaman Muhammad will lead a discussion about the shifting role of the CIO. Now, that series, unlike this one, will be open only to symposium ticket holders. So don't forget to register the MIT Sloan CIO Symposium is May 15th and 16th, 2023 at the Royal Sinesta Hotel, which is just down the street from the Sloan School. We look forward to it. And uh, that's all I have. So bye for now, everyone. See you later. <laughs>